Maturity matters. We sometimes critique somebody um, who continually makes poor decisions, doesn't always make smart choices. We say they're immature. What we mean is that we would expect them to make better choices. Choices that are more appropriate uh, for their age and for their experience. The same is true in our spiritual life. If we still act and think like we did when we first followed Jesus, then we are spiritually immature. And we're much more prone to make foolish decisions and act in ways that aren't very Christ-like. Continuing in 1 Corinthians, we'll be in chapter 3 today. Today, Paul, in the first two chapters, he's been talking about wisdom. He's been talking about maturity. He's made the case that God's way is wisdom. And the world's way is foolishness, though the world sees it the opposite. I think I am. It says I am. Channel 1. Hello? 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 Am I there? Okay. Well, hopefully you at home caught that fabulous introduction. So if we're going to mean basically what, let me back up just a second then. So we're in 1 Corinthians 3. Paul has been talking about wisdom and maturity uh, in the previous two chapters. Uh, he's made the case that God's way is wisdom and the world's way is foolishness. The world sees it the opposite of that. If we're going to be mature, then we need to see things God's way and we need to adjust our lives to that. And so now in chapter 3, Paul begins to directly apply that principle to the Corinthian church's factions. Let's read the chapter. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, you're not, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes it grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but will yet be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours. And you are of Christ and Christ is of God. Paul's getting tough, isn't he? He went through some good foundations in the first chapter, but now he's quit preaching. He's gone to meddling. He's getting personally involved. He confronts 
their condition in verses uh, 1 through 4. He's talking about the immaturity in the church. It's important to notice how he addresses them, I think. He says, brothers and sisters. And these people were part of the family of God. Believers, people who have committed their lives to following Christ. And quite honestly, that's the problem. Though they have the Holy Spirit, they're not behaving like spiritual people, but like people ruled by the flesh. They were immature Christians, like spiritual babies. They were being childish. The King James uses the word carnal right there. That's the Latin word for flesh. We have chili con carne, which means meat or uh, chili with flesh, which sounds really gross, so we say chili with meat. But that's what it means. In fact, it makes me not want to have chili now, you know. <laughs> chili. We have a nice bowl of chili with flesh for you. Doesn't it sound appetizing? Now we're all vegetarians. Some people don't think there can be carnal Christians. You're either a Christian or you're not. It's a contradiction in terms to them, like a tall, short person or dark-haired blonde. You can't be fleshly and be a Christian. So that what they think Paul is really saying here is that these fleshly ones are not Christians at all. But he clearly addresses them as brothers and sisters. And he says they're babes in Christ, and he would not use those terms if they weren't Christians. But these Christians, to some extent, are acting and thinking according to the flesh, not the Spirit. Now, the flesh doesn't dominate every aspect of their life, or then they would really have no evidence of being born again. But Paul's addressing issues where they're clearly thinking in a fleshly, worldly way. One commentator said that the carnal Christian is a child of God, born again and on his way to heaven, but he's traveling third class. So in the last two chapters, Paul has told us about three kinds of people. In chapter 2, verse 14, he talked about the natural person, and they reject the things of the Spirit, right? That's our natural self. So I got to tell you, when you go, well, it's, that's just me, you're talking like a natural person, right? Well, that's just me. Well, that's just why Jesus had to die on the cross for us, because we're natural people. Our natural bent is to want to run away from God and do our own thing. That's what the natural person does. In 2.15, he tells us about the spiritual person who knows the things of God. They've committed their life to Christ. The Spirit lives in them. They understand. They're growing. They're doing. They're moving towards God. Here he talks about the fleshly person or the carnal person who knows the things of God and yet in significant ways is still characterized by the flesh. Which leads us to that horrible question that we have to ask ourselves, which one am I? Because of the Corinthian believers' immaturity, Paul had to treat them like they were immature. And so he says, I kept my teaching to the basics. The irony here is that the Corinthians thought that they were wise. They thought that they were spiritual. It's one thing to be spiritually immature when you first become a Christian. It's another thing completely to be immature long after you've committed your life to Christ. The Corinthians, they believed they were ready for the deeper things, but they were not living out the basic things that they'd been taught. Paul compares the things that he was teaching to milk and to solid food. Now, the difference between milk and solid food is one of degree, not of kind. They were both spiritual things that he wanted to teach. Every doctrine that is taught in seminary can be taught to children, just not with the same words. One church that Amy and I were at when we were first married, I was on staff. The pastor would do a children's sermon every Sunday. So we'd have, I think you were in the nursery till you were four. So we'd have five-year-old kids, you know, kind of up through elementary. And so one of his children's sermons was on propitiation. You should see a five-year-old not try to understand propitiation. They lost him as soon as propitiation came out of his mouth. And so he explained that is that means atoning sacrifice. And at that point, he lost all the adults. They're not two gospels. 
There's not one for the learned, for the educated, and there's not one for the unlearned. There's no part of the gospel that we're authorized to keep back from people. And it wasn't that God was preventing the Corinthians from receiving solid food, the solid food that Paul wanted to give them. The problem was that the Corinthians were kind of attracted to spiritual junk food based on men's wisdom and men's eloquence. If you go to Hebrews chapter 6, the writer of Hebrews is talking to the Hebrews church saying, you know, some of you ought to be mature by now, but you're immature. And here's some of the things, here's some of the basic things he mentions. Committing your life to following Christ. Salvation is a basic, basic teaching. Getting baptized. Spending eternity in heaven. Eternal judgment. Those are the, that's milk. That's where we get started. But solid food involves growing in the Lordship of Christ. It involves applying the truths of Scripture to our daily lives, of learning to discern good versus evil, recognizing false teaching and more. If we don't mature, we're susceptible to half-truths. We're susceptible to half-truths like God just wants you to be happy. Or the health and wealth lie, you give to God and He will bless you with more stuff. Can I just say, I think most of us here understand that God has blessed us because we give, but most of us do not have tons of stuff, right? You don't have to look very far through the, gospel, or through the book of Acts and look at Peter and look at Paul and the early disciples and the early church and go, well, they were given and they were doing this stuff. There's some bad stuff that happens to them. But if you don't train yourselves in Scripture and some guy comes along and says, you know what, if you'll just increase your offering, God's going to turn around and bless you. If you'll buy my $5 prayer cloth, when you kneel on it, God's going to give you extra special blessings when you pray. Can you say scam artist? We need to know Scripture so we know the truth, so we recognize the garbage. They thought the garbage was awesome. Now, sometimes people who have been fed a diet of spiritual junk food, they come and they, and they get a spiritual meal of solid food, and they come away blessed. You hear that sometimes when somebody comes to church, and they're like, I heard more Bible today than I'd heard in a year at the previous place I was at, and I think that's pretty sad. And it whets their appetite for more, but sometimes... People come and they get solid food and they turn away. They don't want anything that deep. I want just enough of Jesus to be saved, but not enough to change my life. So Paul continues on with the Corinthians and he gives them evidence of their immaturity. You don't think you're immature? You think you're wise? Well, there's jealousy and quarreling among you. Aren't you worldly? Aren't you acting like merry humans? They thought of themselves as spiritual, but their divisions showed that they were, in fact, immature. What's at issue is the abnormality of Christians who, in principle, should be focused on Christ, but who, in practice, are focused on the interests of self. They should be focused on Christ, but they're focused on themselves and what they want. And the problems they had in their human relationships revealed that there was something wrong in their relationship with God. It was evident that they were thinking and acting in a worldly way. Divisions and jealousy are not the only signs of immaturity, but they were the ones most evident in the Corinthians. Paul's not saying that they were not saved, that they were just mere men, only that they were acting like it. Christians have a higher calling than living like the rest of humanity. And so Paul brings up that specific situation. He says, well, then how are we supposed to regard our leaders in the church? He continues his rebuke using their specific situation as an example. Paul and Apollos are not the ones that they believed on for salvation. They just brought the gospel of Jesus to the Corinthians. That term servants shows that Paul thought, we're nothing. We're just the servants. We're just doing what God asked us to do. I was there first, and Apollos came. We brought you to Christ. We helped you grow. We did different things. 
And that term servants applies not only to Apollos and to Paul, but to anyone else who assumes leadership role in the church. That needs to be our mindset. That we're servants. Paul's saying, hey, Apollos and I are nothing. It's Jesus who did everything. So what's the use of fighting over which one of us two nothings was the greatest? Now, he's not saying that we need to think poorly of Christian leaders. Because in other places, he teaches them that the church is to respect their leaders, to take good care of them. In the next chapter, he's going to encourage them to imitate him and to walk with Christ like he walks with Christ. But he's pointing out that ultimately our allegiance is to Christ. Christian workers have different jobs. We have different gifts, different abilities. We see different results. But God is the one who gets the work done. When a farmer plants a seed and waters it, he really doesn't make it grow. The miracle of life does that. All the farmer can do is provide the right environment for growth and trust in the miracle of life. And we do the same thing ministering to people. Do you know that I cannot make you grow? I can provide guidance. I can help create an environment where you're getting spiritual food. But I can't make you eat it and I can't make you grow. And quite honestly, that's kind of freeing to understand. I think it's easy for pastors to feel inadequate when they've ministered to people who just will not grow. I have visited, I've called, I've encouraged, I've exhorted some people over the years who always seem to find an excuse not to come, not to spend time with the Lord daily, not to get involved in ministry. I told one guy one Sunday, he was here, and I said, we've been missing you. It's good to see you today. And he goes, well, I'm here every Sunday, you're not. Dude, I'm the pastor. I'm here 48 Sundays a year. Made me laugh. There's always something more important. Or something to complain about. If I've done all that God is asking me, all that I could do, I'm at the point in my life where I'm finally able to release them to God because He's the one that has to change their hearts. I can't do it. He's the only one that can cause them to want to grow which leaves me free to feed the hungry and those that do want to grow. Sometimes we get frustrated because it seems like we're always the ones in the seed planting business and somebody else is always there when the reaping takes place. And too often we give praise to the ones who are there at the reaping and we forget about all those along the way who planted, who tended the garden, who watered, who weeded. Nearly every testimony I've ever heard from somebody who's given their life to Christ involves a whole string of people. People who had influenced them and ministered to them. Real fruitfulness in ministry happens when we are peacefully content with what God has called us to do and we don't worry about who gets the credit. God's the one who makes things grow. We're the size we are. Hope Lutheran is the size they are. Other churches are the size they are. God doesn't call us to be a size. He just calls us to be faithful in ministry. We may get to plant a ton of seeds. Somebody else gets to harvest, and that's okay. Because just like Paul and Apollos were on the same team, we're on the same team. And when they show up in heaven with us, we'll all have a big party, and it'll be awesome. Paul reminds them that he and Apollos, they're on the same team. They're combating the church's desire to divide among the leaders. It would be silly to say, well, planting is what really matters. Or those that water are off the mark, you know. Planting is where it's at. Or the other side of that is watering is where it's all at. Those planters, they need to get their priorities straightened out. And Paul is using their view of him and Apollos to tell them, what kind of leaders they should be. Those that water and those that plant are both necessary. They need to not care about who gets the credit. They need each other, and we're working towards the same goal. We all work together, but each is going to be rewarded individually in accordance with our work, Paul says. He describes himself and Apollos as God's fellow workers. In the Greek, God is mentioned first in every clause of verse 9 to add emphasis to the fact that God's the one in charge. God's the one that gets all the credit. 
God's fellow workers we are, would be the way that would be in the Greek. God's field, God's building you are. That stresses the divine initiative and ownership of the church. Paul means that he and Apollos are co-workers belonging to God. And it emphasizes their unity under God. And so Paul comes to this part. He says, check your motives. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and somebody else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, or costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day will bring it to light, it will, re- it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. And if what's been built survives... The builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. So in describing his work among the Corinthians, Paul begins with a declaration of God's grace. He knew that his status as a laborer was based on God's undeserved favor, not because Paul deserved it or had earned it. It's an exalted thing to be a fellow worker with God. But God doesn't choose exalted people to do His work. It isn't anything in them that makes them worthy to be His co-worker. It's according to the grace of God. God has never said, I really need that person on my team. But it's according to His grace. And Paul laid the foundation when he started the church in Corinth, and he set the one foundation that could be laid, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And he knew, others that would, he knew others would come after him, and they'd build on the foundation that he set. There's only one foundation for the church. If it isn't founded on Jesus Christ, it isn't a church at all. And so one can't build on any other foundation, but sometimes we can build unworthily on that foundation. God's going to test the work of all his fellow workers. Paul uses several materials as pictures of building materials. He uses references to materials that were used in the temple, gold, silver, precious stones. Now, those stones aren't gems, but they're materials like marble and granite. And so if we mix the wisdom of men with the wisdom of God, it's kind of like building a church alternating layers of marble and straw. There's some places, like the barn, where straw is appropriate. It's not appropriate in laying the foundation of a building. It's inadequate as a building material. And in the same way, human wisdom may have a place in life, but not in building the church. There's some things that are logical. God's given us a brain to use, and we can use it in some situations. But to leave God out and think that we can have a plan or something for church and leave God out of it is foolish. We're not building on the right foundation. Our work is going to be tested by God. Fire represents judgment, and it's going to test our works, just like fire would consume wood, hay, and straw, but not gold, silver, and precious stones. So will some of our work be revealed as nothing on that day. It's not the amount of work that's going to be evaluated, but the quality of work. We need to be on guard that we're serving God with the right motives using godly methods. You can't accomplish God's purposes using the world's methods. You're not serving God if you're motivated by your own need for praise, your need to control, or your own selfishness. And while this passage is used in the context of leadership, I think it applies to all of us in our service of God. I think we'll, we'll deal with the discussion of crowns and jewels and all that stuff and what we do with those, those rewards, uh, Wednesday night. But I think we give those back to God. It talks about that in Revelation where we come, we lay the crowns, we lay the jewels at Jesus' feet. I think those rewards that we get, we don't, get, we don't want to keep them for ourselves. We want to give them to the one who matters. And so Paul then gives a warning to them about tearing up God's church. 
Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Later, in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul's going to tell us that as individuals that we're temples. But here, the emphasis on the church as a whole being God's temple. I want you to know, when Paul calls the church a temple, he's not using a picture. This is not a metaphor. The actual temple in Jerusalem is the metaphor, is the picture. It gave them a physical picture of what God was talking about. God inhabited the Holy of Holies of the temple. He would come and visit, but God lives in our hearts. And so the temple was to be a picture of where God was taking this, that I'm going to come to the point where I live in your hearts. So the temple is the picture. And we, God's dwelling in us, is the reality. What makes the church a temple? The Spirit of God dwells in you. The word Paul here uses refers to the actual sanctuary, the place where the deity dwelt. He doesn't use the word that refers to the, the general temple area. And as such, it matters to God how you treat his temple. He says, if you destroy God's temple, God will destroy you. Now, I don't know what that means exactly. But it sounds serious to me. So don't tear up your church. How do you tear up a church? Try chronically complaining. Try gossiping. Get on the phone. Tell somebody your pastor's been there too long. Talk about other people. Did I mention complaining? Keep complaining. Stop things that change. We don't want those kind of people here. We're not going to reach out there. We like it just the way we are. I remember we had a lady in a church that I grew up in. She was a founding member, and she was a chronic chronic complainer. And my dad often said she would love it to still be just the four families that started the church on the corner of the street that they were on. That's really probably what she would like. So we had like our 40th anniversary or something, I don't know, 25th anniversary, something. So they had, you know, some of the founding members up there, and she was up there, and she stood in front of the church, which now had about 400 people in it, and said, well, I missed the days when it was just us four families on the corner. And I thought, I can't believe she said that. Just say, I wish you other 388 people would go away. You've ruined everything. Don't get in the way of what God wants to do. Don't backbite. Don't cut each other down. Don't get territorial. All those things tear up a church. And I've seen folks that have been problems in the church, and let me tell you, there's problems in their lives. And maybe that's how God's destroying them. I don't know. But God takes it serious. And so we need to be on guard. Do we have to agree on everything? No. But the way we disagree, we better do it biblically. And we better do it with love and and work through it. And Paul goes on to verse 18, Don't deceive yourselves. If any of you think you're wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness, and again the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise are futile. If any of you think you are wise, Paul's being sarcastic there. Of course they considered themselves wise according to worldly standards. That was one of their problems, their love of worldly wisdom. So what should you do if you're wise in this age? Paul says you should become fools so that you may be wise according to God's standards. What Paul is asking is that they renounce all humanistic wisdom, man-centered philosophy, even if it means that other people think you're foolish. God has evaluated the wisdom of this world, and he considers it foolishness, craftiness, it's futile. Are we going to agree with God's evaluation or not? 
And so Paul says, have the proper perspective. Verse 21, so then no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, which is Peter, the world or life or death or the present or the future. That kind of covers things, doesn't it? He says, all of them are yours. And you are of Christ and Christ is of God. We're so prone to boast about people, aren't we? We're more excited about being with the influential and the famous of the world than we are about being with God sometimes. Just look at our celebrity culture. If you have a career pretending to be somebody else, we think you're awesome. And your opinion on everything matters, right? And we'll follow you on Twitter. The source of all wisdom. That was sarcasm. We do it in the church, too. Oh, I know so-and-so. I met so-and-so. Well, so-and-so shook my hand, right? And we want to be close to the important, the influencers. How we need to hear no more boasting about human leaders. To say I'm of Apollos or I am of Paul is to have a view that's too narrow, too constricted, Paul says. They both belong to you because the whole universe is yours in Christ. Even death is ours. It's our servant, not our master. Death might be to us like the angel was to to Peter in Acts 12, causing his chains to fall off and leading him through a gate that opens by itself into real freedom. Death is simply the transportation that gets us into the presence of God. It serves us. So what do we do about it? How do we apply it? I think the first thing for us, God's capable of, one, God's capable of speaking to you. You can come away with your own applications. You don't have to do this. But as I pray through a sermon, one of the things I want to do is give you some ideas on how to apply it, the ways that I need to apply it. So the first thing I came up with was we need to commit to maturity. We need to do what's necessary to grow and mature. So we need to be in the Word. If you've been a Christian 20 years, no one should have to tell you that it's important to spend daily time with God and reading His Word. You ought to know that by now. You ought to be doing that by now. Praying, asking God to search your heart, not just giving in the shopping list. Worship, private and corporate. Fellowship. This morning in Sunday school, we had a great discussion and and somebody pointed out how good it was to come together and be encouraged and to be um, how we learn from each other and how important that is to our spiritual growth. Second thing, serve with proper motives. Be a servant leader. Serve God and serve others. Don't do it for recognition. Don't do it to control things. Do it because you love God and... He's called you to do something. Third thing, love, respect, and protect the church. Don't allow yourself to get pulled into a faction. Boast in Him. He's given us all things. I jump jump points there. Let me back up. Don't be pulled into a faction. Don't become a complainer or a gossip. Anything that would tear up the church. Finally, be humble. Recognize that God's the source of of wisdom and all good things. Here we go. Now, boast in Him. He's given us all things. That's Christian liberty. That's that freedom in Christ. He's given it all to us, right? And remember how we worry? Like, oh, we got too much freedom. We're going to do all these things. We're going to act like, well, I got my fire insurance. I go do anything I want to. Paul tempers it then with the accountability. He says, he's given us all things, and we're in Christ, and there's our accountability. How we use our freedom is controlled by Christ, who is in God. May maturity be true of us. 
May we love, may we grow, may we serve, may we give in the way that God desires. Let's pray.